time to time, a sea current brings death to the Galapagos Islands. El Niño, a meteorological phenomenon which is becoming notorious all over the world, heats up the waters on the Pacific coast and causes terrible death and destruction to animal species. But Galapagos is not dying. The arrival of El Niño is just a part of the ancient cycle of death and rebirth, a reminder of its genesis and a repetition on an infinitely smaller scale of how life colonized these islands and transformed them into an earthly paradise. A fissure in the Earth's crust. The boiling, burning material from the center of the Earth bubbles up to the surface. Iron, sulfur and silicon at over 1,000 degrees centigrade. Something like this must have been the origin of the Galapagos Islands, but with one difference. The birth of the Galapagos Islands occurred underwater. At first glance, the landscape could not seem more desolate. A handful of burnt-out islets almost a thousand kilometers away from the nearest coast. It seems impossible that life could reach this land of volcanoes and yet from the very moment that they appeared on the surface five million years ago, the Galapagos started to prepare themselves to house life forms. Erosion. This was probably the first step. Winds and water currents broke up the volcanic rock in a gradual process in which enough level of soil was formed for a seed to germinate. The wind and the water joined forces in this job. Not only did they erode the rock and so create soil, but they also brought real specialists from the continent that accelerated the process. Algae and lichens split up the rock, forming sediments and eventually soil. Then the chain became unstoppable. This is Brachytherius, a specialist in the colonization of lava. It hardly needs soil to survive, but its little roots work on the lava by fragmenting it in such a way that a path is cleared for more complex plants. But how did the Brachycerea seed reach this lava? And an even more difficult question to answer, how did animal life get here? The Galapagos arose from the sea, so unlike most islands, they never had any contact with the continent. All the living creatures that inhabit these islands had to cross a thousand kilometers of sea without fresh water and exposed to the equatorial sun to reach these new desert islands. Seabirds must have been the first visitors to the Galapagos Islands. They have more than sufficient strength to arrive here from the continent and the trade winds must have made the journey easier. At that time, the islands must have had no life whatsoever, but this did not concern them. If truth be told, it actually worked in their favor. <coughs> 
Frigate birds, seagulls and gannets, like so many other seabirds, found their food in the sea and used the barren volcanic rocks as stopover points where they could get their strength back. But as there were no enemies or predators from which to protect themselves, it was also a wonderful place to hatch their eggs, especially for those species that lay their eggs on the ground without even bothering to make a nest. Birds such as these blue-footed boobies or those that nested on the rocks must have been the first to breed in the Galapagos. In the beginning there were no trees, so birds that made their nests in branches had to wait until the vegetation became more complex. A process to which the birds themselves contributed by bringing seeds that had stuck to their feathers or legs, or in greater quantities in their stomachs, from which they ejected them in their feces. Even before the complex plant world of the Galapagos had developed completely, the first land-based vertebrates must have arrived from the sea. Pieces of wood, pieces of continental vegetation, or hollow light trunks became floating islands on which some animals managed to cross the sea from the continental coasts. It was very difficult for amphibians and mammals, but among reptiles, real specialists in desert conditions, success eventually arrived. Land iguanas could well have arrived sailing on floating logs. This must have been the case at first, although they only managed to colonize the Galapagos when plant life provided them with a source of food. Anopuntia, one of the many species of giant cactus that inhabit the islands. The fruit in the cladode of the Apuntias are the main source of food for the land-based iguanas of the Galapagos Islands. Its tissue structure conserves water and the reptiles obtain food and water at the same time. The fruit contains the seeds which are protected by sharp spines, but the iguana's scaly mouth is designed to conquer these defenses. And in the long term, the cactus also benefits. As a payment for the food, the iguanas excrete the Apuntia seeds on their travels around the islands, and so the giant cacti gradually colonize new territories. When the Galapagos plant life allowed birds that nested in the trees to breed, a rapid process of colonization occurred, which has continued until today. And, as might be expected, the first settlers were seabirds. A colony of frigate bird young. Few birds make such spectacular efforts to find a mate. In what will be the nest, the males make their gullet sacs swell up to attract the female's attention. This process involves an enormous use of energy, but the effort is worthwhile. The female frigate birds only hatch every two years and they only lay one egg, which makes them more demanding when it comes to choosing a mate. The aim of the male's display is to show the females how strong and resistant they are, two qualities which they will need when it comes to bringing up their small number of offspring. The only chick will take from seven to eight weeks to raise and the parents will have to take turns at the work. The job is so hard that each week in the nest, the adult on duty loses a fifth of its body weight, which means that only the strongest survive. And these are those that make the most dramatic mating display.
The blue-footed boobies are much more prolific. The nest is little more than a clearing in the sand in which they will lay two or three eggs. Incubation on the ground has its disadvantages. Heat without any protection in the shade is terrible and may be dangerous. But the boobies have learned some tricks to make the stifling heat more bearable. The so-called gula ventilation is one of these tricks. A quick movement of the folds of the skin under their beaks generates a current of air that evaporates humidity and cools them down. Also, the self-sacrificing parents know how to make use of currents of fresh air. When the wind gets up, they position their bodies so that when they fluff out their feathers, the breeze cools their backs. The birth of the chicks occurs in sequence, as does the laying, with a period of three to five days between them. This has a terrible but practical purpose. If there is a good year and there are plenty of fish, the boobies can raise three chicks. But if there is a food shortage, the largest chick will receive all the food and the others will gradually die off according to their size. A dramatic way of ensuring the survival of the greatest possible number of offspring.